Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Emily, as Steve said, and normally you'll find me in a red T-shirt next door looking after the kids and being with them. So it's great to be with you guys as adults today. Now, one thing that we do learn from a very young age is the love of a good story, right? Whether it's a story in a book or a story on a movie, maybe a comedy series, maybe actually it's a non-fiction versus a fiction story that we love. But we all recognize that we love it when someone tells us a really good story. But the thing that perhaps we're not so aware of is actually each one of us here is actually writing a story. You're creating a story right now. And it's called the story of your life. Sounds pretty dramatic when perhaps your morning has consisted of coffee and toast so far. But you are each writing the story of your lives. If you think about it, if somebody comes and asks you a question, um, something like, you know, where are you from? Or what school did you go from? How did you meet your partner? Um, what type of things have you done as a job? And what are you doing as a job now? Actually, each of us flashes back to a time in our past, a chapter of our story in which to answer that. I remember sitting and listening to my granny um, tell stories. I'd ask her questions and she would tell me about her life, about what it was like um, growing up as one of 11, only two of them girls. That's a lot of masculinity in the house. Um, she told me about how she met my granddad. She told me about how during the war there was a German pilot who crash landed outside of Barham and was escorted away mysteriously by the police. She told me about how my mum had lost her brand new sandals in a bog because she had refused to take them off for a walk and they were never to be seen again. She told me the story about my auntie, who still remains the most stubborn lady I've ever met. But at three, she decided she didn't want to go on a bike ride that my granddad was going to take her on. She was strapped to the back anyway, and in protest, she stuck her foot in a moving wheel and subsequently then got septicemia. She still is a very stubborn lady. <laughs> Those are great stories that I loved listening to and that she loved to tell. But the reality is when those things were happening to her, I doubt very much she thought about them as if they were going to be a story she was one day going to tell her grandchildren. Because actually, they were just events that were happening. And the same is true for each of us, isn't it? That when we are in a situation or when something is happening to us, very rarely do we stop and think, that's going to be a story that I will tell one day to somebody. They're just the present. That's just an event. But actually, when you stop and think about it and look back, actually every significant or unusual event in your life, actually, once it's behind you, it does form part of your story, a story that you might tell. But the question really comes is, is it going to be a story that you tell, that you're going to smile about or share with somebody and share confidently? Or actually, is it going to be part of your story that you're going to want to hide, that is painful or embarrassing or it is shame-filled. And often the determining factor to which one it's going to be will be the decisions that we make whilst the story is unfolding, when we don't actually necessarily know what the ending will be. Will it be thoughtful responses or will it be emotionally fueled reactions? Now, as Steve said, today we're on part three of our series, Better Decisions and Fewer Regrets. And actually, the big idea behind this whole series is if we actually take the time to ask ourselves better questions and then to honestly answer them. And if you didn't see Mike's talk last week, then I seriously recommend um, catching up on it, about how we can honestly answer the questions and then we act on those things then actually we can make better decisions. And when we make better decisions, we will have fewer regrets. And our hope actually here as a staff team, as a, as a church, is that when we make better decisions, this won't just affect us, but actually it will influence and affect the people around us as well. Because actually our decisions impact our families. They impact our friends. They impact our work colleagues. Which means that if our decisions impact them then unfortunately our regrets do as well. 
So over the next few weeks, um, we're going to be taking a look at various different questions. Now, the questions are taken from a book written by Andy Stanley uh, by this title. And actually, they should help us to learn to respond better in situations. Because responding beats reacting every single time. And today's question that we're taking a look at is a big one. It is the legacy question, okay? The question of what legacy do I want to leave? And we're not talking about money and property and things like that. But what story do we want people to tell of us? Because actually the reality is we might think that the story is in their hands about what they're going to say. But actually the story is in ours. We each hold the pen to our own stories. So when we're facing a decision of magnitude or consequence, what I really want us to learn to do, and off the back of this talk, is to pause and to think, what story do I want to tell? When this decision or this season of life, when this relationship or when this business deal or when this illness, when this job or task is done, what story do I want to tell off the back of it? Do I want it to be a story that I can smile about and share with my children and grandchildren? Or will it actually end up being a story that I have to hide away in shame? See, the decisions that we make now determine the answers to that question. Now, we might not be able to control and determine the outcome of our decision, Because let's face it, there are lots of pitfalls in life and lots of bumps along the road that we might not foresee. But actually, we can always control the part that we play in something. So, for example, let's say your boss comes and he asks you to lie to a client because he knows that if you lie to the client, they're going to get a better deal and you need to lie. And it's your boss that's making the request. So you think, I don't have any room to not do this, so I'm going to lie. So you lie to the client, but the client then finds out. And actually, your boss, he throws you under the bus and he says, it's nothing to do with me. They were the one that lied. And you lose your job. Your stories now become that you lied to a client and you lost your job. Your story could be this, though. Your boss comes to you and asks you to lie to the client. And you say, no, I'm not going to lie to them. That's not part of who I am. That's not part of my value system. I won't lie. And your boss says, okay, you don't want to do what I'm going to tell you to do? Then you're out. Still not a great story because you've lost your job. But actually, your integrity is in place. How about this one? Your friends want you to go out, but actually you have an exam that you need to study for. And they push you and push you, but actually you say, no, I'm not going to go out. So you stay home, you study, you absolutely ace the exam. And actually, that's a decision that you then make time and time and time again. And actually, you end up going to university, you get a degree, and you get a really good job. That's a good story, isn't it? Based on that decision to not always say yes to your friends. Well, how about this one? A relationship ends. And, you know, you're struggling to know what to do. You're feeling the real pain of it. And actually, it just becomes easier to perhaps drink a little too much in that situation. And you start to make some unwise choices. And actually, because maybe you're losing a bit of the respect of some of the friends that you have, or they make you feel awkward about the choices that you've made, you start to hang out with different people. And actually, you make more unwise choices, particularly around the partners that you have. That's not a good story, It's an understandable story because, let's face it, we all understand the pain of heartbreak, but it's still not a good story. And actually, it's the decisions that we make in the valleys of our life that actually will determine what type of stories we have on the other side of those valleys. So, when you are facing a decision of any magnitude, then actually we need to learn to pause, to look ahead and think, when this is nothing more than a story I will tell, what story do I want to tell? When this is nothing more than a story I will tell, what story do I want to tell? Am I going to focus on the immediate or am I going to focus on the ultimate? Now, there is a really good story in the Old Testament which shows these two examples. Do you focus on the immediate or the ultimate? Um, And it's a good story because there are two really contrasting examples of people in this. There's um, one group of people um, who is there in an emotionally charged situation, and they make a decision on choosing the immediate. And there's another individual who finds himself in lots and lots of emotionally charged situations 
but who chooses always the ultimate. And it's a story that is very familiar to lots of people, whether you have been in church before or never before. And it is the story of Joseph. Okay, so I want us to scroll back to 1800 BC and we find Joseph and he is 17 years old and he is the 11th of 12 sons. And actually he's finding himself in a no-win situation that actually isn't entirely of his own making. Because you see his father Jacob, his father Jacob loves him. Loves him in fact more than the other brothers before him. And he loves him because Joseph's father, Joseph's mother rather, is Joseph's father's favourite wife. Now understandably this very demonstrated love that Jacob has for Joseph, it fuels a fire of jealousy in Joseph's brothers because they know that they aren't loved or valued in the same way as their brother. And to be honest, Joseph doesn't really help matters. He's not very diplomatic about it. He very easily and very quickly rats out on his brothers when they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And he keeps bragging about these dreams that he has where his brothers have to bow down to him. But actually, it's the fact that Joseph's father, Jacob, loves him best that actually fuels this jealousy and hatred. And eventually, this jealousy gets to the um, the better of them, and they plot to kill Joseph. So they have various different ideas about how they're going to do it. And eventually, they decide that they're going to throw him down a well, and they're going to leave him there to die. But then they see a slave trader walk past, and they think, hang on a second, that's a bit more of a profitable way of solving our problem with Joseph. And so they sell Joseph to this slave trader. And then they have to go home and give the best performance of their life. They have to tell their father, sobbing with tears in their eyes, how a wild animal has come and taken their brother and killed him. And to make it more believable, they've taken Joseph's coat and they've smeared it with blood. Now, I want you to stop and think for a moment. These young men have been fueled by hatred and they have made a decision, which means that for the rest of their lives, they have a secret that they are now forced to live with, a lie that they have to live out time and time again. Their story, because of that decision to throw him in that well and then to sell him to the slave trader, Their decision has made their story this. I was so jealous of my younger brother that I, along with my other brothers, beat him up and sold him into slavery. There was 10 of us and one of him. That's not a good story to tell. Or even this one. We lied to our father. We broke his heart and said that his favourite son had been killed by a wild animal. And we covered his clothes with blood so that it was more convincing. And we continued that lie all the while knowing he was still alive but in slavery. That is not a good story. And actually it means that Joseph's brothers are now liars for life. And I really want to implore on you... Do not decide anything that will make you a liar for life. Because whatever you gain in that moment, whatever you gain by what you've done that makes you have to lie, it will not be worth what you are forced to carry into the moments that follow from there. So back to Joseph. Having been sold to the slave trader, he now finds himself in Egypt and he finds himself being auctioned off. And he's bought by this military man called Potiphar in Egypt. And he gets to go home with Potiphar as a slave. Now all this stuff has happened to Joseph and it's not of his making, it's not what he would choose, and it's not fair. But Joseph is now faced with a decision. He's got to decide what kind of slave am I going to be? What type of person am I going to be in the midst of this situation, even though I never chose this situation? Do I run? Do I stay but behave like most slaves, which is to do as little work as possible with as bad an attitude as I can get away with? Or do I actually throw myself into this situation, do the best that I can, irrespective of the fact that this is not what I wanted, expected, or even deserved? 
And actually, I think that that's the choice that most of us in this room face. There are going to be times when people will take control of our stories because their choices and their decisions will result in parts of our story that we never intended, wanted, or asked for. There are circumstances in life that send us with curveballs and give us things that we'd rather not have. But we're faced with that question, who do I want to be in the midst of this circumstance? What story do I want to tell? Now, the amazing thing about Joseph is he chooses to do the honorable thing. He doesn't choose the easy thing or the understandable thing. He doesn't get fueled by emotion and anger like his brothers, but he chooses the honorable thing. He does the thing that he knows from God is the right thing to do. So Joseph serves Potiphar like he is serving at his own household, and he works hard. And God blesses this decision because in Genesis it says this, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Now, that's a story worth telling, isn't it? I was kidnapped. I was sold twice. I was a victim, but I decided not to be a victim And I wasn't a victim. I was put in charge of stuff. But actually, if you know the story, then you'll know that there are more twists and turns to come in the story. Because actually, Joseph finds himself yet again in a situation that isn't of his making. Because Potiphar's wife takes a shine to him and she wants him to, um, she wants to make him her lover. And so she keeps kind of like putting herself in certain circumstances and keeps trying to persuade him that he wants to do this. Now, Joseph has faced with a choice. And to be honest, both options are pretty bad. Because if he sleeps with her and he's discovered about it, it's likely to end in death. If he refuses her, it's likely to end badly for him. But Joseph still does what he knows is right with God. And so he says to Potiphar's wife, he says, With me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. In other words, I was a slave, but he has given me this responsibility. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God and what I love about this bit is actually Joseph perhaps unwittingly has shown us the basis on which he makes all of his decisions and actually it's the basis on which if we make our decisions on that basis we will have better decisions and fewer regrets and it's this Irrespective of what other people have done to him or tried to do, irrespective of how he might feel and what he might have wanted in that situation, in this situation he asks himself, what would God want me to do? What is God's story that he wants me to live out right now? Because Joseph says, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin? Not against Potiphar, who's given him all of this responsibility, Not against you, Potiphar's wife, because you're a married woman. And not even against myself, Joseph would say, because actually I'd be letting myself down if I did this. Instead, what he says is, how could I sin against? How could I hurt and go against God? See, the basis of Joseph's decisions was always, what is God's story that he wants me to live out right now in this situation? And so in the situation, he chose what he knew God would want for him. And so he refuses Potiphar's wife, and he does that day after day after day, and every time she comes to him, so much so that she then responds out of frustration. She wants to take revenge. How dare he reject her? So she kind of orchestrates this situation where he's found in a compromising situation, and she turns and says, he's raped me. And Potiphar believes her and throws Joseph into jail. Again, doesn't sound like a great story, but it's a better story because he stands there and Joseph can say, I acted with integrity. Now, Joseph ends up in jail and he ends up in jail for a very long time. And perhaps, perhaps like lots of us, when we're in a situation which feels like it is never ending, we find ourselves thinking, well, is this the end of my story? Is this where it's going to be? And it'd be really easy to give up in that situation and to just be like, what's the point? But Joseph doesn't. 
Instead, Joseph does exactly what he did before in Potiphar's household. He lives and he makes decisions that he thinks will honor God and honor other people. No matter his situation, no matter the circumstances around him, he honors God and other people. And actually, when you read on, several years later, because he's in prison for a long time, he reaps the reward of that. Because Pharaoh has a dream. And it's a dream that nobody can interpret. And then one of his servants remembers a time when, unfortunately, he was in jail, but he'd met Joseph, and Joseph had interpreted this dream for him. And so he says, I know a man, Pharaoh, that you can come in and he will interpret the dream for you. So Joseph is pulled out of his cell and brought before the most powerful man in Egypt, Pharaoh. And he's told, you must interpret this dream. And Joseph does something completely surprising. Because if you think about it, this is Joseph's get out of jail free card. All he has to do is interpret a dream, which he's done before, and Pharaoh will let him go free, potentially. But Joseph says, I can't do it. I can't interpret your dream. Which, let's face it, is a dangerous thing to say to the most powerful man who you don't know what he's done to all the other people who've said, I can't do it, before him. But he says this, I can't do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Because you see, Joseph knows that it is God who answers. It is God that guides. It is God that makes sense of it all, even when things feel like they are falling apart. It's God that can do incredible things, like the thing that Pharaoh is asking him to do. And Joseph knows that actually what matters here is not his story, his getting free. What matters here is God's story. No matter the twists and turns in Joseph's own life, he knows that his own life only makes sense when it is intertwined with God's story. Because Joseph has learned this important truth, that actually life is not about the journey or the destination. It is about the company. Joseph knows that if he follows God's lead, if he lives God's way, if he lives with integrity and makes wise choices, when he respects God and respects other people, if he lives out God's story in this situation, then his story will be one that he can tell. His story will leave a legacy that goes beyond himself. So Joseph listens to Pharaoh's dream and he explains that Egypt would experience seven years of really amazing harvest. They're going to get so much food, it's going to be really bountiful. But then they are going to have seven years of famine and the famine is going to be so severe that everyone will forget even about the good years. And so Joseph then boldly, because it's really bold to tell the the most mighty person in Egypt what he should do but Joseph turns around and says what you need to do Pharaoh is you need to find a wise and discerning person to put in charge of Egypt someone who'll prepare for what's coming now Joseph isn't trying to put himself in there he's just saying this is the wise thing to do this is what you need to do and so Pharaoh smiles and he says to the people standing around him can we find anyone like this man one in whom is the spirit of God And I can't help but think when I read that, that actually, if Joseph had just interpreted the dream, if he'd never attributed his ability to interpret the dream to God, whether Pharaoh would have actually chosen him. But Pharaoh says to Joseph, since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. And in this moment, Pharaoh makes Joseph the prime minister of Egypt. Now, that's a story to tell, isn't it? I was sold into slavery. I made good of that. I then was in jail. Now I am the prime minister of Egypt. (coughs) Well, if you know the story, then actually you know that Joseph keeps doing what he's done in all the other situations, which is he lives with integrity and he follows God. And so seven years later, as predicted, a famine hits and it devastates this region of the world and everyone uses up their personal grain store and it runs out so at that point Joseph then opens up the centralized grain silos and he feeds the nation and before long actually people are coming from all over the place to come and buy grain including and if you know the story Joseph's brothers dun 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 plot twist 
And they arrive, and Joseph immediately recognizes them. He recognizes his brothers. But because the last time they saw him, he was 17, and now we know he's probably dressed in Egyptian gear, his brothers don't recognize Joseph. And so Joseph decides, I'm going to test them. I want to see if they're still the same brothers or whether or not they've actually changed. And actually, through their actions that then happen, through the tests, the brothers unbeknowingly show Joseph that they've changed, that actually they've learned from their mistakes, and that they're now people of honor and truth and integrity. And so Joseph, he's just like, this is great. And he finally reveals who he is to his brothers. And his brothers... Well, they don't go, wow, this is amazing. They're terrified because they think that Joseph is going to take revenge on them. But Joseph does exactly what he has always done. He lives out God's story in that situation. He forgives them. And actually, he gives them the food that they need. And he brings them and their families and his father to live in Egypt, to be reunited and to live under this palace and place. And here's the point of the whole of Joseph's story that we're looking at today. Life is going to throw stuff at us. Other people's choices and decisions will change and affect our stories. But we will always get to choose what story we want to tell out of that. See, Joseph never intended to become the most influential person in Egypt. He never set out to rescue a whole nation from famine. But one decision at a time... One response at a time, he wrote a story that not only was a great story for him, but actually it was a story that rescued a nation from famine. He lived his story, intertwining it with God's story, basing his decision on what God would want him to do. And the results were incredible. In fact, one of the most famous quotes from Joseph's story is this. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, that was only possible because Joseph went against the gravitational pull of bitterness of deciding to become the victim in the situation. He went against the temptation to try to get everything that he could get because everybody had taken everything that he'd had. So the question remains for each of us here is, what story are we going to tell? What decisions will we make in the situations that we currently find ourselves in, good or bad? I think one of the wisest choices you can make right now is actually to surround yourself with people who can help you to discern what God would want you to do in each situation. People who can cheer you on, who can pray for you, who can support you and guide you. Craig Rochelle, who's an American speaker and writer, he says this, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So surround yourself with people who can help you to tell the best story of your life, one that has God at its centre. Now, if you're new or visiting, maybe for you the brave decision is to keep coming back for the rest of this series, to keep coming on a Sunday and putting yourself in this environment and just hearing about who God is. If you've been coming for a while, then maybe your next step is actually to join a Forge group. Maybe it's to go to Alpha and find out about what this faith thing's all about. Maybe it's to join another group where it allows you to talk to people, ask questions, get their advice about what they would do in your situation. Maybe for some of you, actually, you've been going to a group for years and years and years, but your next step is to find some running mates, not because you're going to go running with them, but because running mates is a chance to meet with two or three people who can ask you really difficult questions, where you can be honest and go, you know what, I am really struggling in this area. This is happening, or I'm tempted to do this. And they can go, let me pray for you, let me support you, let me encourage you to make wise choices. Life is not going to be easy, and doing the right thing doesn't always end out with the best results. We know that, don't we? But actually, the question is, are you going to choose to live a story that you are proud to share? Irrespective of what happens, you can say, this is the part that I played. But more than that, a story where you can share what God has done in and through you, through all of those circumstances, A story that when you can see that you have doubted, when you have had mountains you've had to climb, when you've had battles that you've had to fight, you can still say, God can be trusted all the way through those things. 
you get to decide one decision at a time. But here's the other part of the story that we don't often remember. You see, God always wants the best for us. He really does. But we're not always very good at choosing at what's best for us. And there's going to be people here today in person or watching online. And actually, you've been living with regrets. You know the pain of bad decisions and choices. And actually, if we're all honest, that should be all of us here, isn't it? We've all got things that we regret in life. But perhaps there's some of us here who are living with the long-term consequences of real regrets in our life. And actually, if that's you, then I want you to know this. Your past may shape you, but it does not have to define you. Sometimes the most beautiful things come out of the most broken places. And God doesn't see broken things the way that we see them. Where we see damage, God sees possibility. Where we see waste, God sees worth. Where we see an ending, God sees a beginning. Your brokenness, your shame, the parts of your story that are so messed up, that are so deeply hidden, that you feel are the worst parts of yourself, where you feel broken and you have to hide them away, those are not a barrier to God. Instead, it is an invitation to his healing, his wholeness, and his redemption story. See, that's what God's story, that's what the whole story of the Bible is about. It's about restoring and mending and working with broken things to bring about healing. And actually, we forget when we look at Joseph's story that actually that those messed up brothers who lived a lie for decades, who plotted to kill their brother and then sold him into slavery, actually, they become the 12 tribes of Israel. Their families, their lines are interwoven into the story of God's redemption because they are the great, 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 and as many greats as you can imagine, grandparents to Jesus. And Jesus came to rescue us. Nothing and nobody is irredeemable to God. And no matter what mistakes you have made and mess ups, he still loves you and he can still use you. That's his story. And he wants it to be your story too. The question is, and the question always is, are you willing to intertwine your story with his? So Becca's going to sing a song in a moment. And I want you not to sing along. I want you to listen to the words. And I want you to think and ask yourself, in the situation that I'm currently in, what story do I want to tell? Will it be a story that I can tell over and over again? One where actually the main character isn't even me, but it's a story that speaks of who God is and the way that he is faithful, the way that he loves, the way that he provides, no matter the mountains that you face and have to climb. And no matter the mistakes and the regrets you've, um, you've had, a story where you've played your part, where you have followed his lead, even when you had no idea of what the outcome was going to be. A story of his greatness, his love, of who he is. The question is and always is, what story will you tell? Because only you get to decide. <laughs>